this bass sounds analog. Sounds fucking sick. How is it going, everybody? I'm Olian, host of this brand new short cast series specifically designed to improve my, but hopefully also your house music productions. So this episode is going to be all about how to become a better producer. So I thought it might make sense to invite someone who actually is a very good producer. And so I'm extremely excited to be joined today by Josh Baker. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure, man. It's nice to be on the other side of the questions for a change. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So yeah, Josh, you're a very successful DJ being booked internationally, but also an amazing producer releasing on super nice labels. So production wise, what would you say were some of the key factors that have gotten you to the level where you are now? So the biggest contributing factor to getting good was collaborations with friends. I fell into a fortunate position where a very close friend who actually works for Syntho now, Brandon Darby, was making music at the age of 13, 14. And we were in the same classes together. And he was very ahead of the time. He had influences from his sister, his sister's boyfriend, and he was collecting records at a really young age. And from there, I became friends with other people who were slightly older with influences of house music. And yeah, Brandon really got me to production. And then I got the ball rolling there. And then I went to Leeds University for a year. I met Ryan Murray, who we released some tracks together. I think I was 18 then. He was better than me, so I sponged loads off him. Then I started doing lessons. I started getting good. And then someone called Alfie Jack, who I released music with, he came to me for lessons. However, he was really good as well. So I learned loads off him. And I think one of the biggest things for me was I really used all the people around me to gain bits of insight from different people. And I'm kind of going through it a bit quickly here, but... You know, it was just a matter of iterating, finding out what, was, what wasn't working. And then, you know, say, if I knew Alfie was good at a certain thing, I'd ask him to feedback on that. And then also my friends like Seven and Meal, who were local dub, they were producing. And I just fell into a circle of people who all had a fascination for production and all wanted to get better. And we spent days making music together. So we were really just immersing ourselves in a studio together and just saying, right, we're going to make two tracks today and sitting in here until it was done. So the collaboration was definitely a massive factor. And another thing which helped me get over a brick wall um, for a while, I'll never forget, I told Kurt, who is my business partner and agent once when we first started you and me, our party after about a year, I don't think I can produce, man. I'm a DJ. I can't make tunes. I'm never going to be able to do it. And he was like, oh, you'll be fine. You, you only just started. You're young. And then there was a guy in Manchester who was a techno producer who was doing one-on-one -on -one lessons and he said why don't you want to give him a try and i was like you know what why not so this was probably about two three years into production and i went and saw him and i then learned what an eq was i was actually making amazing tracks but with no knowledge of what an eq was what distortion was i was just making really good grooves hearing things and trying to replicate them and then i realized there's plugins out there so i was doing everything because brandon was was teaching me um, to do everything with stock. So I was creating bass with operator, with analog, Ableton effects, and making really interesting tracks. And um, I then was told, okay, there's this whole world of plugins. I was like, oh my God. So I bought Trillion by Spectrasonics. I bought Sound Toys. And then that was when things started to get good because, you know, the reality is with music, if you can invest a bit of money, it can speed up a lot of the process. You know, if you can create any sound you want with Ableton, However, it just takes longer. Whereas decapitated sound toys, you've got maybe 20 presets, which all sound amazing. You flick through the presets, you've got a great sound straight away. So this was a massive breakthrough in the production journey. So if I combine that little leg up through one-on-one -on -one with the collaboration, then this is what really, really helped me get to where I am now. And I would never say um, I've not done a degree or anything like that. It's been very much just listening to tracks being like, how did you do that? Figuring it out and using friends around me to help me figure it out as well. Yeah, totally. So replicating tracks obviously also has been uh, very helpful for me to pick up certain techniques and skills. But I feel like sometimes I also got frustrated trying to replicate certain things and not being able to figure them out because maybe I just was lacking some skills to make that happen. And I actually also tried to replicate one of your tracks called Jam Sandwich, which is probably, uh, probably my favorite of yours. 
and after the breakdown there is this crazy spin back drum fill thing which i really really liked and i was like i'm actually going to try to replicate it but <laughs> i got nowhere near uh creating that one do you know which one i'm talking about that one so it's this one Yes, <laughs> it's exactly that one. So since you're here anyway, maybe there might be a small chance that you could show me or show us how to replicate a sound like that. That would be awesome. Okay, so this is the Jam Sandwich project. This came out on Automatic Writing, which is a French label. I met these guys at a after party in Paris, actually, and then showed them some tracks and then happened to end up releasing a label. And it's probably still one of my favorite EPs to date. And this was the lead track. So to do this, you just need to find an audio sample of a vinyl scratching. I actually have seen people do it themselves. So you could set up a turntable and literally put a new uh, record on there and just flip the vinyl back. So you can either do that or find a sample. This is just a an actual sample my, uh, I found myself, I believe. But you can hear it work with all the other effects. So what I like to do is, when there's a drop, I've got a specific tutorial on this on my actual YouTube page called um, Fills and Effects, something like that. So if we look at this little groove here, so we've got 89 to 93, that's four bars, and then another four, four bars there. At the end of every eight bars or, si or 16 bars, I like to have like a, a call and response between different effects. So you'll see here that when there's one bar to go, I've got an effect coming in there. And then I've got another effect. Well, it's not actually turned on. I've got that one there and that one there. Then if we come back to another breakdown, see at the end of these bars. So there again, this one. So it goes, it works together to go. And again here. And having two sounds together almost masks what's going on. So for example, where you've asked me there, how did you do this sound? If it was just on its own with no other effect, you'd probably be able to tell. But when you hear multiple effects coming at once, whether it's from audio or a VST, I think it makes them glue together and sound a bit more pro. Whereas if you just got a random, you know, like tech house tracks, you might just have a riser like this, for example. Let me find like a classic tech house riser effect. Like, this isn't a good example, but... You know, that on its own would sound quite obvious. But if you had this next to... Or that, for example. You could put this down here. And then put this riser there. Is it this one? This one there. And then delete the side of this. I'm going to double click this white riser. I'm actually going to reverse it. And then we've got this double effect which could sound awful but i'm just gonna use it for demo purposes so i'm even going to chop this like this so it goes so it's more of a kind of hit and i'm actually gonna put it here so turn them down so it doesn't kill everyone's ears and so it goes see great example so if it was on its own, this would just go. But with the two effects together, almost sounds like one sound. So if we put some reverb, some delay, some reverb, some delay, let's put loads of random delay. Let's just go for it. Um, and it's something that works almost every time and obviously this doesn't really fit with the vibe here but you can see the process of getting two effects either from audio or trying to get something yourself doing a quick chain on them almost just doing it without thinking you know using some phases some delays getting some tremor bit of reversing gets all work together it just makes it sound like a more finished piece and then the listener also can't really decipher exactly what's going on, which for me, when I'm listening to demos, for example, I always find the difference between the, the rookie producer and the more advanced is usually the finer details like the effects because it makes the whole track flow better and have a more cohesive journey, so to speak. So yeah, that was quite a 
turned into quite a long explanation, but that's basically showing you how I like to use effects in my tracks. And uh, yeah, sometimes I'll just use a quick audio sound that I like, or I'll spend long with Omnisphere, depending on the vibe of the track, depending on if I find something good. And sometimes just depending if I'm being lazy or not. Sometimes being lazy just results in me whacking an audio sample on there. But sometimes that's the best uh, the best result. So there's not really a right or wrong way. Mm -hmm. Dude, thank you so much for opening up that session. It was very interesting to see also how sometimes you hear very complex stuff, but there might be a simple approach to uh, create those kind of things. And sometimes I'm wondering for myself, uh, what should I learn next? Should I cover all these basics and get very good at certain things? Or because there's so much info out there and so many things to learn, what would you say, what would make sense to focus on most when it comes to learning, like more like fundamentals or just being creative? What would you say? Yeah, there's a level to it where I think it's good to learn, you know, the very basics, which yeah, is 100% important. However, there's also the the fine line between are you just spending the whole time trying to sound design things when you can actually just get stuck into it, find a great sound and get creative. And I think the question you should ask here is what am I trying to do? If you just want to make some music, some bangers, you know, to play in the clubs for your friends, maybe you don't need to spend three years learning about, you know, synthesis, the ins and outs of all the parameters. You can really, the word plug in, you can literally plug in and play and have fun really quickly. And it was Trillion by Spectrosonics that I got, which is just for bass. And I was like, wow, these are the bass sounds I was trying to make. And I would never have been able to create them inside Operator. My sound design skills are no way near the level to the sounds in my head. However, you know, all these classic sounds that you hear, the SH-101 basses, those Moog basses in there. And then I was like, right, now I can have some fun. And then the amount of tracks I was making um, increased because I could get a good bass sound quicker. I was then having more fun. It was very much a compounding effect that once I started creating the sounds I actually wanted to create, then I really got a bug for it. And then it just kind of went like from making a bit of music to realizing, okay, this is how we do it. And then it was just a you know, free for all for probably four or five years. I think me and Alfie alone made 50 tracks in a year just between wow. us two, plus all the ones I did. This was the year before COVID when the lockdown happened. We just went went for it. We would be sending back and forth. We'd come in the studio together. We were just relentless and really kept each other um, accountable. Like, come on, send me that project back. And we went from like being decent to pretty good after that. And someone asked me before in the Syntho Discord about what's the best way to learn. And someone gave some feedback about making notes, etc. But if you never actually do the thing you've took the note on, it's never going to stick. And it's like anything. It's all about repetition. Do it once and do it twice, do it three times. And maybe after five times, you'll remember exactly how to create that sound, how to go in that flow. Then it gets quicker and easier. And then that's when the magic happens. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, making some magic happen is something that many of us want, I guess. But sometimes this process can be a little bit uh, difficult. But you actually created uh, an online learning platform called Syntho, which you just mentioned, um, to help many of us uh, in this process. So I actually checked out your website and everything, and it looked very, very interesting, not only because it kind of hits the sweet spot of the sound that I like, but also of the different content that you offer, like track remakes. I, I saw on YouTube where you have a bunch of content about the site that uh, you had, like crazy guests, like Mad Villa, this kind of stuff, track breakdowns, which help you a lot, just like the session we just did. Mm, but something that made me especially curious about the uh, Syntho Hub is that you've you guys developed an app which you integrate straight into your learning process. Maybe you could give us some background about how, why you've come up with creating an app and how it's going to help users uh, in their production journey. Of course. So there was these limiting factors that I couldn't get past for for the member experience and just the vision I had because... I wanted to create a community of producers so people could help each other. And it was almost something that ran itself and people could come to connect, get feedback, learn. And it was just an ecosystem which was seamless. But we were using Zoom to do lives. We're using Discord to chat. We're using the membership site to watch the videos, Instagram to chat. It was all very disjointed. I was like, right, what if I could put this all in one place? It could be a social media thing which meets music education. So I started, I wrote down this this plan 
I'm going to make an app. We launched about two weeks ago, and I think it's something which is going to completely change the face of music education because now there is no need for people to go and do a either a nine grand degree or they don't need to pay for one-on-one lessons because I'm building it in a way which you can get access to unlimited amounts of content from your favorite producers, but we're also now developing a system where you'll be able to get feedback regularly. This has been a hard thing, figuring out the feedback system. No one's nailed it because obviously feedback takes time. So to offer feedback at scale at an affordable price is very hard, but we've figured something out, like a a really good system, I believe, which will change things for all members because they can work, create, then receive, you know, this is what you're doing wrong, this is what's doing right, and go away and fix that and then come back a few weeks later and we can help you again. So that's where we're at now. In January, we're thinking to launch it in an eight-week cohort so you could join. Then over the span of eight weeks, you will follow a cycle. So week one, we may do an introduction into finding your own sound. Then you get an assignment. Then week two, we come together and we say, right, week two, we're going to combine different flavors and put together an eight-bar loop with this, etc. Then in week three, week four, we go over eight weeks with the end having an assignment. Then it comes back around and starts again. So this could offer producers who struggle with accountability something to follow. And it also means we can really nurture artists to where they want to be. So there is infinite possibilities because now we have an app ourselves. We can develop new features um, such as we've already developed a notes feature. So when you're watching a video, you can make your own timestamp type notes which then sync to your profile which can check later so it's almost like watching a lecture make your notes and then on your profile you've got all your own notes saved so we want to turn it into something which is the pinnacle of electronic music education that sounds really exciting of course uh, i do like a, a notes feature like that because i tend to make notes either on paper or on, on a sticky note text edit thing on mac and i tend to lose them or lose overview of these things so it's nice to be able to come back to them uh, maybe one question i would have is of course you guys are offering some great content and these kind of things but what should members bring to the table because education is usually a two-way street um, so what would you say would someone who decides to head over and join uh, the syntho hub what do ha they have to bring to the party to make most of the syntho experience and this kind of stuff Okay, it's an interesting question. So the reason we made this app was because of this problem when it was just videos. It was a one-way street in terms of you'd come into the app, um, into Syntho or any other of these learning platforms which people have created and it was just videos. Or you could go in the Discord, but there was never quite that stickiness and the engagement where you'd come through, you'd sign up and straight away you're part of a community. It wasn't like that. You'd sign up, you'd get some videos like, what do I do next? Whereas now with the app, you will sign up log in and be inside a system where you've got your own profile you can direct message so immediately it gets people more engaged because i know most people's problem is not lack of information now there's information everywhere the problem is accountability discipline and motivation if you want to say that so what they need to do is ideally have a clear idea of where they want to go and they need to keep themselves accountable but that's why We're trying to do things inside the app to help with this because if everyone was, you know, disciplined and, and that, then life would be much easier. But that's usually most people's problem. But I would say you need to be dedicating. I say that the best way to do it is repeated small sessions than opposed to one long session. So some people say like, okay, I can just make music on a Saturday. But I don't think that's that effective. I think it's better to the, get the repetition in through the week and things stick then. And this further supports why we've done this app because it's on mobile and desktop so now you can replace the tiktok scrolling on your lunch break with watching a tutorial then th this could then motivate you to get home and make music so it's a, it's a kind of like a whole thing here we're trying to get at that you kind of live and breathe it and it becomes part of your life because how much time do we waste on tiktok instagram facebook but we're only doing it for entertainment but what if you can replace that you know doom scrolling entertainment with something which is getting you closer towards your goals so yeah it's hopefully something that can slot into your life and make everything easier opposed to like right i really need to commit to this we're trying to make it so as effortless as possible with the features in the app if that makes sense
Mm. Yeah, totally. Uh, that's also something I've been trying over on my Instagram channel to create some content, some short content that you can just look at here and there that's production related since, I mean, people do spend a lot of time on social media, so why not put something in there uh, which is useful. So thank you so much already, Josh. There were some super interesting insights uh, in there. So maybe to summarize for myself, um, I would say accountability and a network you said are super important to have some producers around you. I realize I have some producer friends, of course, but uh, I'm not always connecting enough, not working on it together. And every time I do feel like I do get some good feedback and just show people ideas. And also, yeah, sometimes you end up in this production tunnel and don't know if it's good or not. And it's always good to get some cool feedback and from friends even and become friends with people um, who are also producing. And then secondly, what I found very interesting also is that um, I, I like to get technical sometimes. I do like to check out the synthesis uh, things and um, look at things in detail. But if I want to create music and make things a bit lighter and get more creative, I guess I should work on my setup to be able to just use sounds and make music with them. I sometimes get stuck like get throwing together some drums like a drum kit um, and then being too tired to actually use them to create a drum groove. So uh, that's something I'm going to try uh, working on for sure. So, yeah, as I said, thank you so much. But maybe since we have some time left over, it's the first episode, you had the Jam Sandwich project open. Do you think there might be some other uh, cool things that you could show us um, from that project to round things off? That would be great. Okay, so let me show you a bit about the low end as well. So we've got this groove. And... When I made this track, I was really going through a phase of being quite fascinated with trying to get my tracks to sound old. I very much still am. But to get this groove like this, I went for a kick drum, which I sampled from a vinyl. So I'm going to show you the kick drum without any of this processing on. Look, the kick is to the right. Then I'm going to take this filter off. The kick actually sounded like this. So completely horrible, something I would never recommend anyone doing. However, I did it. I recorded this, this sampling from an old record. I then put it in mono. And I was experimenting with different with bits here. In the end, I decided to go there. I'm not quite sure why. And then I used the filter inside Ableton. So if you go in the bottom left, I went to get rid of the top end gets rid of that click so i would say the kick is probably missing some information i would normally want in the mid-range and high range and then i use this eq to try and get rid of some resonant frequencies and then i use this transient shaper by isotope to just get it tighter basically so i've got the attack turned up so i just find that gives it a bit more of a click but not too much and then the sustain just to make it tighter. And what's cool is you can do different bands on here. I'm not a complete expert with using this actual plugin, but you can see here that it's doing a nice, a nice bit of work to make it more prominent. And you can use the mix bottom right as well to just kind of dial it in where you want. So that's the kick drum and I've got a basic groove, then I've also got this little shuffle at the end. So you see this extra kick with the velocity down. And even when it's just the kick drum playing, having one or two extra kicks somewhere in the pattern can really bring the groove back around. And then with the bass, I have gone for the famous Lately bass. But this is actually recorded from the Yamaha itself, the Yamaha TX81Z. I've got a proper one and it's oh, gone yeah. through my ghost mixer as well and i sometimes i kind of like say oh it doesn't matter how you make tunes but this this bass sounds analog it sounds fucking sick so if we take these it does yeah. it sounds sick it sounds there's something different about when the bass is from analog there is something different about the transients the overall tone that can't be replicated in the box i think to make these kind of like standard dance floor hits you can do it inside the box, but there is something different about 
Well, I've, I've seen loads of people using this lately, bass recently, but VST versions, and it does not sound as good as that. So, the melody is just this. And this note goes down at the end. And then the bass is um, processed with this EQ to begin with. I've then used the Moog filter by UAD. This is just using a bit of the drive and a bit of resonance there. I don't think that's doing really anything. Then kickstart, which is the side chain plug I always use. Then mono to make it go mono. Then this little compressor. I don't know why I compressed it. I really couldn't tell you. Probably didn't need it, but yeah. Then if we play them together. I think it's a really really nice groove between the two they seem to sit really well and i think because the kick's quite um quite you know dusty and imperfect and imperfect this analog bass with the subtle groove sounds really cool and another tip for this bass is is that the velocity on the notes is quite low which is why it's not too kind of pinging in your face i think a lot of people are using that lately bass sound at the moment and the late the velocity is all the way up which can sound really good but it's always worth trying velocities a bit lower because it can sound, you know, it's a different tone. And in this instance, that's what's giving it that um, vibe. And I'll also show you the snare because the snare's fucking nice in this track. So, and it's just super simple. So, just this one sample. And I've used the Pull Tech by UAD. You can get a free version of this, not by UAD. But they've always got these really nice presets. Snare fat, use that. Bit of EQ, just get some low end. And then I'm taking out some harsh frequencies there. If I just show you the whole chain. Just to get it to be a bit brighter. And the very last thing I wrote down actually to show people is just to remind you about track delay. So if you don't know what track delay is, if you go bottom right inside session view, there is a D button. And if you can't see the D button, it might be because the I.O. Sometimes people can't see it. I think it's the I.O. But anyway, I can see it. There should be a D button down here. Hit it. And this track delay opens up. Track delay basically pushes um, your channels back or forward, depending on how um, you delay them. So if I just do this and turn the delay up. It starts to lag. It almost sounds like your computer is glitching. But if you imagine yourself recording your tracks using only analog machines, you're always going to get some kind of latency or a bit of delay in the recordings. So just by delaying elements in your drums and synths, bass and kick, etc., you're going to start to get a bit more of a natural groove between the, the elements. So it's something that's always worth doing, whether it be slightly, just two milliseconds. Or five. See, it starts to sound a bit looser and a bit nicer. My taste right now is I like to do things a bit looser. So if we do the hats. And this as well. Let's put something else in. Yeah, you can just do that crazy stuff. Even do the bass. That one's way too much, but so you can start to feel that all feel a bit older and more analog. Well, it's not more analog, but it sounds like it's been recorded with machines because it's all a bit looser. So I think that's another telltale telltale sign in a you know, not beginners, not the right word, but a production which hasn't had as much thought gone into go into it because everything's quite stiff. But track delay is a super simple um, thing to use, which I still don't think many people are aware of, especially the newer producers. As there's quite a big obsession with making things dead, dead tight and hard and and um, punchy, where making it a bit sloppier, I say, can be really good. So. Yeah, man, that's my production um, insights and, and some knowledge to share with the viewers. Dude, 
Awesome. Once again, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, showing us the project, giving us some insight and tips. Um, yeah, maybe for a future episode, we could have uh, an actual user of the Synthohub over uh, to get some, like, some first-hand uh, experience or info about their experience over there. That would be awesome. This would be amazing, man. We've already thought about doing something like this, but it'd be cool to have someone else asking the questions. So yeah, I'd be up for that. And if anyone's ever got any questions, my inbox is always open. Uh, Synth has a £10 trial as well. So if you want to give it a go, um, you're more than welcome. You can cancel at any time. And yeah, hopefully I will meet some of the listeners soon. And like I said, just go on the YouTube as well. We've got some great material on there. The Instagram is always jam-packed with information every day. And yeah, thank you for inviting me, Vincent. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, it was good to um, show some insights and, and talk about the Syntho journey. Yeah, of course. Also, thanks to all the viewers out there for tuning in into this first episode of my shortcast. Please let me know what you think about the format in the comments. Um, I think the feedback is very helpful and also it always gets the video more more visible in the algorithm. You know what I'm talking about. Like, subscribe, and I hope to see you for the next one.